Hello and welcome to St Helen's Parish Church online for Sunday the 18th of July 2021. My name is Emma Howarth, I'm one of the lay readers at the church and I'm going to be walking us through the service today. I'd like to encourage you to join in in the words in bold in white and with the singing we're going to have a couple of songs today and I'm sure you'll be um, familiar with both of them. Debbie Williams is going to be preaching today from Ephesians and Debbie is about to start her training to become a lay reader within the Church of England in September. So we're really pleased that she's uh, giving the talk this morning. So let us begin our service. As we begin, I'd just like you to pause a minute and think about the other people from our church family who will be joining on joining us online this morning and also for the for the people from our church family who will be joining us in person in the church building and i wish you all a very good day so we begin our service on sunday the 18th of july 2021 from st helen's parish church online welcome Welcome in the name of Christ, God's grace, mercy and peace be with you and also with you. And so we open in prayer together. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Let us say it together. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, I would encourage you to join in with the next with the first song um, if you don't want to that's fine but the words will be on the screen O oh Christ the great foundation May the God of love and power heal us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we will hear our reading from Ephesians brought to us by Anne and after which uh, Debbie will bring us our talk. The reading is from Ephesians chapter 2 beginning at verse 11 one in Christ. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who was made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. I'm only going to use the one slide this morning because I'd like it to act as a as an aid to reflection as as we go through the talk together. I'd been hoping to use the arm of the cross and the body of the cross as a way of reflecting the key messages I wanted to take from the talk today. I was hoping to use reconciliation as the arm of the cross and the word transformation as the body of the cross. Unfortunately, that proved to be beyond my technical skills. Basically, the key message that I'd like us to take from this passage today are that Jew and Gentile have been reconciled through Christ Paul is making the point in this passage that both we as Gentiles and also those Jews who believed that upholding the law and doing good works was the way to be saved were still lost and excluded from citizenship in God's kingdom. God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us in order to reconcile us to God himself, to unify the two peoples. In Jesus' time, there were only two peoples. There were Jews and there were people who weren't Jews, and they were called Gentiles. So, where we were once, as Paul says in 2.12, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, we were without hope and without God in the world. We are now reconciled and brought near to him. Paul shows us in 2.13 when he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. So we've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, as Paul mentions earlier in verse 2.10. But we cannot receive this gift through doing good works. We accept Christ into our lives. We are saved. We receive God's grace. We receive the Holy Spirit. We are transformed. Our relationship with God is a journey of ongoing transformation as we come to know him better through his word and through prayer, through following Jesus more closely and through connecting with the Holy Spirit within. Christ came to bring peace, harmony, reconciliation and to teach us to live a non-judgmental lifestyle learning to live together and to behave lovingly towards each other even when we disagree. That doesn't mean pretending. It means finding a way to discuss our disagreements openly, to acknowledge each other's right to hold different opinions, to actively listen to each other and to learn from each other's reasons for holding different views. That way we may not change our own, but we can learn to respectfully disagree and to find a way to compromise with each other. And I believe that the living in love and faith journey that Nigel mentioned last week is encouraging us to work on finding a way to do this together whilst going through this process. Paul mentioned several points that we perhaps need to explore a little more in order to really reflect on what he's saying in the passage and then to consider what it may mean for us today. If we look at separation, what does it mean to be separate from God? Perhaps for now it's enough to acknowledge that being separate from God means to be without hope, without life in all its fullness. Are there times when you feel separate from God, when hope feels far away, when prayer is not answered in the way that you've asked? I know that I've experienced some of those times in my own life, yet somehow God has always broken through the despair and the hurt He's always found a way to bring an unexpected moment of closeness, however fleeting that may be. And however fleeting that moment may be, it is enough to keep the flicker of hope alive and to continue the transformation process. Sometimes transformation has meant letting go of part of me that I held dear. Sometimes it's meant letting go of someone else that I held dear. But God has always been there waiting for me to see or feel his presence in the life going on around me until that connection with his spirit within grows stronger again. To go back to the text and Paul's message of separation, while Jesus was growing up, Gentiles were separated from God because they were unbelievers and as such were uncircumcised. 
circumcision of male babies was a fundamental part of the Jewish faith. According to the laws outlined in Leviticus 12.3 and elsewhere in the Old Testament, male children were to be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. Jews were not the only people in the ancient Middle East to be circumcised, but circumcision was seen to be an essential part of keeping the laws regarding being a Jewish male. Gentiles could be accepted as proselytes into the Jewish faith, some were circumcised as adults, and if they kept to all the laws of Torah and had their male slaves circumcised, they were considered Jewish. There were also some proselytes who didn't fully convert to Judaism. They refused circumcision and only observed part of the laws of Torah because they were drawn to the ethos of the religion and believed in one God, but they didn't want to adhere to all of the Jewish laws. In Jesus' time, there were many Jewish people who chose to follow Jesus, and they would have recognised this progression and perhaps found it difficult to understand why followers of Jesus would not be circumcised as part of their commitment to faith and belief in one God. Indeed, there's a description in Acts 15 too of a dispute over whether people needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. So in the Old Testament, the Jewish people were those chosen by God to witness to his covenant, his promises to his creation, and they were to be the ones through whom his message would be shared with the rest of the world. In order to make an obvious difference between themselves and the Gentiles, they were given laws to keep. However, the Jewish people were enslaved for a large part of their history. They suffered as a nation, even though God had chosen them to be the light that shone his blessing over all other nations. But he chose to be born into the Jewish faith, to grow up as a poor carpenter, to be immersed in the faith that he had chosen to bring his word to the world initially, until the time came for him to begin his ministry. Perhaps the link we need to make here is that in Jesus we see that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Throughout scripture this point is made from Old through New Testament teaching. Think of the story of David, of Esther, and of Jesus' submission to the cross. Jesus submitted to a terrible death and shed his own blood so that we might be reconciled to God, so that God could look upon us in all our insecurity weakness and faultiness. His blood covers and hides any sin and fault so that we can bask in the glory of God's presence in our lives. We can experience the love of God that he imbued in us when he created us. We are no longer separated from him. God and his son Jesus will use any of us to share the good news and to help grow his kingdom through our demonstrating his love for each of us and for all of God's creation. We can spread the gospel by kingdom living just as strongly as we can by standing up as teachers and leaders of the faith using words. This is why God gives each of us different gifts and encourages us to use and develop those in our everyday lives as we grow in faith and discipleship. In verses 14 and 15, Paul makes the point that the two are united as one. We are reconciled in Christ, so there are no more differences between Jews and Gentiles. No more differences in people of Christ. We are no longer foreigners in a strange land. By Christ's sacrifice and the blood he shed for us, we are now all part of God's kingdom. As followers of Christ, we are accepted as children of God saved by grace, not by any action that we can take. Through salvation, we become brothers and sisters of Christ, and so we no longer need to be circumcised to prove this. Paul was making the point that Jesus' followers did not need to become Jewish before they could experience salvation. Jesus' death on the cross meant that the Torah could be set aside. As Paul says in verse 15, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And the new covenant which Jesus gave us made the most important commandment to be love for God and for one another. 
out of this would come natural respect for the original commandments and for caring for God's creation as we learn to live in peace with each other, respecting diversity and the uniqueness and goodness of each part of God's creation, just as he originally intended. Jesus divided the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles and made us all one in his name. Neither group is meant to be more special or above the other, just as we are all equal in God's sight. These were two groups who had never previously been interested in sharing even a table before they came to know Christ. And here he was, expecting them to be welcoming and sharing genuine caring and hospitality with each other. This has great resonance for us today, living in a world that's become so much smaller and more diverse with the advent of world travel, making emigration so much more available, at least prior to COVID. God created each of us unique, yet in his own image, different, yet some part of us the same. He then removed any differences or barriers to accepting each other, just as we are, through Christ's salvation on the cross. He wanted to create one new humanity, one which could live in harmony with neighbours they had previously had nothing in common with. This has tremendous implications for us today, even with our, our own churches and Anglican communion, as we grapple with issues that can create huge differences in each area of life, whether political, personal or religious. Like Jesus, we're made to be in this world, but not of this world. And what a struggle that sometimes creates for us. Think, for example, of the current discussions around sexuality and the living in love and faith discussions that are being held across our churches or the situation with refugees trying to find a safe place to settle and how we react to them, or simply with new people we meet who are seekers, as yet unsure of whether they have faith, people who may have many questions and doubts that they could be afraid to ask us about because we are perhaps wary of engaging in those types of discussion. How much have we questioned our own faith and really thought about the reason that we believe as we do? Do we feel comfortable to discuss those questions with others and to admit our vulnerability if we're unsure of something? Didn't Jesus himself tell Thomas that those who had the ability to believe and to know something deep inside themselves, even if they couldn't see or touch it, would be blessed? I love to read some of the science and religion debate articles and I'm heartened by the writings of people like John Lennox who can provide scientific evidence for their biblical belief. And part of me knows that if we can engage in these types of discussions with people outside of church who have questions, that will be a hugely powerful witness. But I believe because I experience the living God in my life. I feel his presence in my daily walk. I see Christ in creation and I marvel at the beauty and intricacy of it. I see God at work in my interactions with some of the people that I meet and I feel his love for me, sometimes at the oddest moments. And then I know deep down inside of myself that no matter what mistakes I have made or what I may have left undone that day, I am loved. And that is exactly the same for you and for every other Christian. There is nothing more powerful than that experience. Isn't that why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper? To live inside of us and maintain that sense of connection and core guidance, even when we can't see or touch the person of Christ himself. A helper who would reinforce our reconciliation to the living God. The more we immerse ourselves in God's word and in prayerful conversations or prayerful meditation in God's presence, feeling his gaze upon us. Perhaps as we listen to a piece of music or appreciate something in nature, the more we feed that connection to the Holy Spirit and the more closely we naturally follow Jesus' path in our lives as we are transformed. Jesus came to save us by grace from our sins, to make us alive with him, to raise us up from death and to show us how to be fully human. So that the closer we walk with him and the more we choose to think about what he would do in any situation before we act or speak, the more like him we can become. Yet though we struggle and fail regularly, 
His sacrifice ensures that we remain part of the body of the children of God. He came to preach peace between the Jews and the Gentiles, between all of us, to remove the same law that separated Jew and Gentile, which also separated man and God. Christ, in his sacrifice by the shedding of his blood, bore the curse of the law for all of us. He died to make reconciliation possible, and as Christians, we are charged to live to make the message of reconciliation personal. As Christians, if we can model this kind of living to people outside of the church, how powerful will that message be? So how much are we currently modelling being ambassadors for peace? Have we accepted the ministry of reconciliation that God gave us when he reconciled us to himself in Christ? I think that reconciliation and peace are definitely part of an ongoing journey, a learning process that's gradually transforming all of us. So I'd like to leave you with a question of, where is your journey taking you? And who in our faith community is walking alongside you? Who is God calling you to walk alongside of outside of our church? Is there someone that you are praying for that you can develop fellowship with? Someone God is telling you that he wants you to invite in and offer a safe place to question and explore? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here today to worship and praise you and for all you provide for us. We remember those who cannot be with us this morning for whatever the reason. Almighty God, we pray for the leaders of government throughout the world that they may have a true desire for peace and be willing to be unselfish in its attainment. We ask for nations that are in conflict to bring an end to violence and oppression. Help us and all Christian people that wherever we go, we may bring the peace of Christ. Amen. O oh God, since you are the light and guide of those who first put their trust in you, enlighten with the grace of your Holy Spirit the minds of those who are called to decide great issues that they may be saved from false choices and that in your light they may see light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless your servant, our Queen, and grant to her and all her ministers the counsel of your spirit, that her people may be ruled in justice and righteousness and may be enabled to live in peace to your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have made us members of Christ and of his church in this parish. May we, as a congregation, reach upwards to your throne in worship and adoration, inwards to one another in understanding and fellowship, and outwards in the world in evangelism and social compassion. Make us like a city set on a hill whose light cannot be hidden, so that men and women of all ages may find Christ as the light of the world and his church as the family of the redeemed and eternal life as their gift through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God of love, whose compassions fail not, we bring before you the sufferings of all mankind, the necessities of the homeless, and all those who suffer mental health issues, the pains of the sick and injured, the sorrows of the bereaved, the helplessness of the aged and weak. Comfort and relieve them, O oh Father, 
according to their various needs. We ask this for your great mercy's sake. Amen. Lord Jesus, we beseech you by the loneliness of your suffering on the cross to be near to all who are desolate and in pain or sorrow this day and let your presence transform their sorrow into comfort and their loneliness into fellowship with you for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Lord, we thank you for our families, our friends and all whom we love. We bring before you now those dear to us who are ill or in hospital, those who are in trouble, those awaiting test results to provide a diagnosis on their health, those awaiting sur surgery, and we bring before you now Chris Spencer and pray that the date for her operation will be sooner than expected. And we ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn, that casting every care on you, they may know the consolation of your love. And we remember Jean Platt and her family on the sad loss of her husband Barry. Surround them with your heavenly arms and this we ask in your name. Amen. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, be near now to all children and students who will be finishing for the summer holidays. Be with them and keep them all safe as they enjoy time with family and friends. Refresh them so they can be ready to start another academic year in September at school or university. And this we ask in your great name. Amen. Grant, O Lord Jesus Christ, that we who have gathered here together in love and faith and prayer may have received you into our hearts and when we go from here may our faith not fail nor our loyalty slacken go with us to be our comfort and strength now and always and all these things we ask in your great name amen come set your rule and reign in our hearts again Increase in us we pray Unveil why we're made Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come invade us now We are your church power in us and we seek your kingdom
darkness clear Show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Set your church on fire Win this nation So as we draw to the end of today's gathering, I'd just like to extend my thanks to Debbie for preaching and for the Bible reading, Janice for the prayers and Nigel for the editing. Uh, please join us again next week and uh, we really welcome back Rachel next week. So we look forward to that. If you would like to give to the work of St Helens Parish Church, uh, these are some of the ways you can do it. You can do it through the Parish Giving Scheme or you can do it by text message. Here is a suggested £10, but it doesn't have to be 10 So you text that the, those words there, STH, STHPC GIFT, and then the number, which is the amount you want to give to this number here. Or you can do it via the Parish Giving Scheme. And now we we'll just gather ourselves before God as we disperse into the world. So can we say together, God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. Amen. <laughs>